so dr shah your uh, this title of the session is reinventing business purpose and profit i mean some would call it semantics uh, milton friedman very famously had said that the only social responsibility of business is to make money for the shareholders now that has clearly evolved uh some say that the friedman thesis is dying or some have even declared its death how do you define your uh, concept of reinventing business to shankar first it's a pleasure to be here with everyone i feel that the world has changed a lot more so over the last couple of years than what we've seen over the last decade and in the world today it's become even more important to focus on purpose this is not a new concept it's a concept that has been there for many years and in fact i'll go back to the time when our founders started this company in 1945 they put out an ad in times of india outlining the principles under which mahindra was born and those principles outline the dignity of labor it talked about meritocracy it talked about the fact that caste creed nor color shall come in the way of someone going ahead in the organization it talked about responsibility to society and it outlined in effect what purpose meant to the organization that has been the dna for our organization for the last 75 years and today it becomes a lot more important because the society is watching organizations around and looking at whether they have purpose and a responsibility to society or not uh, and that is how society and consumers will make their choices on where to spend their money so purpose is not just important from a sense of societal values it is also a key driver of profits today and what our job as leaders is to look at how do we drive both purpose and profits because if we focus on purpose and live our responsibilities we will make good profits for our investors so social responsibility in some ways is adds to your brand value and uh, enhances your ability to expand your market share uh, in a sense there is a clear benefit on brand value it is who we stand for uh, today we see a lot of consumers deciding what they buy and where they buy from based on the values that they associate with and that is important that's very interesting because i mean you know to go back to the history of the formation of mahindra it came after the uh, just before the party it used to be mohammed and mahindra and uh i remember this ad now that you mentioned it uh it was based on the trusteeship concept of mahatma gandhi uh, that the entire ad was done uh, now when we talk about purpose and profit we have to in the current climate and i'm using climate as a pun here in terms of climate change also uh we have the concept of uh environment social responsibilities and governance now to the skeptical indian this sounds a bit like old thepla in new packaging but uh, and the more it is propagated larry fink wrote a letter to people sequencing people planet and profits uh, is this doable is it real do you see this happening or is this one more uh attempted uh, repurposing so the reality today is that world temperatures have risen by close to 1 degree and if they go up by another half a degree on average it will cause a lot more natural disasters we are already seeing many of them around the world so climate change is not a topic that is an intellectual topic anymore it is one that's real and if we don't act on climate change today then we will have failed as an old native american proverb says we inherit we do not inherit the world uh, we borrow it from the next generation Correct. so that is our responsibility for the next generation and 
this is something that we have to act in concert. It just cannot be left to governments to say, you please take care of it. The private sector has to play an important role. Our sustainability journey started 15 years ago uh, because we recognize the importance of these actions. But what I will also add is that this is, again, not divorced from profit. So if you look at the various projects that we have done for sustainability in the last five years, we've done 2,000 projects. These projects have had a cumulative return on capital of 24%. And that is because we are reducing energy. Today, we use 25% less energy to produce one vehicle than we did five years ago. Uh, we are water positive across all our plants, collectively across the group. We have the first carbon certified plant in India, in Igatpuri. Uh, we've just recently launched uh, net zero homes. This is Mahindra Life Spaces. And construction and operating homes or residential homes uh, constitutes about 40% of carbon dioxide that's released in, the, uh, released in the environment. And that is something that, again, we are addressing. So all of these things add up. Uh, to create a significant difference, and therefore corporates have to partner with governments to lead this effort. So when you say that homes account for 40% of the emission, it also includes construction material that is used in uh, a living cause. So how does a company like you sort of work at the idea of uh, zero carbon, carbon emission or net zero carbon emission or reduced carbon emission? Uh, you are, of course, uh, a major supplier of uh, something that consumes fossil fuel, which is uh, vehicles. Uh, you're, you're also building. So is, is, there, uh, is the focus cost e effective for you? Have you been able to sort of uh, bring down your costs and be uh, more uh, profitable for your stakeholders? Because at the end of the day, that also matters. So I'm going to come back to purpose first and then talk about profit in yeah. terms of how to balance mm -hmm. both. The Paris Agreement talks about net zero by 2050. Our target is to be net zero 10 years earlier, by 2040, despite producing all the vehicles and tractors that take up a lot of energy. We are well along that path, though what I would also add is for the world to reach that goal, it will require new innovation. And we are partnering with various companies and associations around the world to drive some of those innovations. Now, let's take a micro example on the profit example that you mentioned. We have a business that has three wheelers. And we've been manufacturing ICE and CNG three wheelers for many years. Over the last year, we've been selling electric three wheelers. Today, 70% of our three wheelers sold are electric. So we've seen that transition from ICE to electric already. And we have a 65% market share in the electric three wheeler market. Okay. So as we think about profit, this is a very profitable business for us that is helping the planet as well. So it's about finding the opportunities, it's about acting on them. And therefore, profits will follow. If you work with purpose, profits will follow. So there is some truth to the Larry Fink theory of triple bottom line. There is truth to it. And what I would add to it is that if an organization is not purpose driven, they will likely find it difficult to survive over time. So <clears throat> just to transit from this area to another uh, aspect. I mean, everybody here is watching the news, what's happening in Ukraine for two years. This is probably the first physical conference that's happening in Mumbai after a long time uh, because of the pandemic. So we've had disruptions uh, in a series, so to speak. Uh, how do you, as the CEO of a large diversified group, look at and plan for disruption? Now, mind you, the disruptions are both on the supply side and also on the demand side. Now, on the supply side, we know now that what we thought was a global supply chain is essentially a Chinese supply chain. And on the demand side, people's tastes are changing. Um, the way uh, products are being offered are changing. I think yesterday or day before, Deere launched its first autonomous tractor, 
people are looking at autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles. Airbnb is looking at more people working from home, so Airbnb bookings are changing. How do you sort of look at these transitions and how do you plan and execute your uh, idea? So Shankar, this is one important aspect of reinventing business, which is how does one thrive in uncertainty? And that's what led to my comment earlier that the last two years have seen a lot more change than we've seen in the last decade or maybe even more than that. Uh, it reminds me of this old game I used to play as a youngster called Whack-A-Mole, where something popped up, you knocked it down with a hammer and two other things popped up. So you're constantly knocking things down with a hammer. And that's exactly the world we're living in today. Uh, the new car that we launched, the XUV700, has 130 semiconductors. And every week we might get a call from one of our component makers that the semiconductor for this component is not available, so we can't send you this component. And our team has to then work through production schedules to say, well, we can produce a car, but we can't put the wireless charger in there. Or we can't put this other thing in there because we don't have that one. And how do you plan for that? Uh, and the lessons we've learned from that are first, first around leadership mindset. The positivity that we bring in terms of how do we tackle these problems. The second one is around scenario building and planning ahead. Uh, even as we look at Ukraine, uh, we have built various scenarios around potential impact to commodities and start planning for things three, six, nine months in advance and have plan B, C, and D laid out as well. Uh, the third is around what I call optionality, which is build options, pay a certain price for it, and then we have the ability to double down the option. So these are things that we are doing to be able to thrive in uncertainty. And the final comment I'll make here is, this reminds me of Talib's book from a few years ago called Anti-Fragility. And that really talked about the concept of not surviving in uncertainty, but thriving in uncertainty. And that's the opportunity for organizations. How do we become stronger and how do we thrive in uncertainty? So there's this quote that was often attributed to Lenin that nothing happens for decades and then in weeks, decades happen. So we are seeing all kinds of acceleration of adoption of technology, of practices, human behavior. So within your group, how do you deal with this whole new animal called work from home? One thing we've always done well is had a lot of empathy towards our associates and have had the flexibility to meet their needs when they wanted to. Work from home is something that we are looking at closely in terms of what form should it take? Should it take a form that everyone can work from home whenever they want? Should it take a form that you have a couple of days where you work from home and three days in office? Because recognize the one important thing that's lost in there is the ability to create, to innovate, to be able to meet each other. Uh, I can get my work done for today by working from home or for the next week, but that's a transactional outcome. But if I really want to thrive in the organization, I need to build the relationships because it's the relationships that's going to help me make the difficult actions done. And that's difficult to do to work from home. So that's part of what we're looking at right now. And the other aspect to that is fairness. Why should some people work from office and others work from home? Uh, so I don't have an answer to it today, but that's part of the discussion we are having internally, getting input from various others. And what we will come out with is some flexibility that allows people the balance. At the same time, that allows people the ability to collaborate, to build relationships, and to be able to get further in their careers, because that's important for everyone as well. In a, in a business where, for particularly automotive design, engineering, and you have other businesses, Mahindra Tech, uh, where collaboration is an essential aspect. So, in the past two years, and now, uh, you know, the, this whole talent battle, I'm told in Bangalore, people are giving BMW 7 Series cars to hire people. So, in this talent battle, how do you sort of engineer a structure where uh, you can get collaboration. I met somebody this afternoon whose title was Chief People's Officer, which was an interesting aspect, uh, sort of uh, take on what's happening in the human resource market. 
how, how do you get people to collaborate? Uh, do, because you have a factory which requires physical presence unless you have sort of automated it uh, using the facilities of Instrumental or some such company, uh, or you have um, Tech Mahindra where you can do a sub. Construction requires physical presence. Uh, how do you sort of have the different pieces? I'm asking you this question as somebody who's heading a diversified group. I mean, you know, you can't be possibly having the same set of solutions for uh, all the entities. How do you engineer this? So that's exactly right. It cannot be the same set of solutions. Hmm. Each entity has its individual problems and solutions. So what is done for Tech Mahindra will not necessarily be done for our auto business. So first it starts with empowerment. Each entity is free to make its own decisions around what it needs to do. What is common though is the culture and the values. And that is something that we closely guard. That culture is based on the foundation of values and the behaviors that we want to propagate are being agile, bold, and collaborative. So the kind of people that we attract are ones who like the values and what Mahindra stands for. That in itself is a starting point to be able to get the right people into the organization. And then as I see the culture around them, that automatically gets them to start collaborating more because that is feedback that is given to people regularly, saying, how good are you on this spectrum of being agile, bold, and collaborative? And that drives that behavior across. So I wanted to move a little <clears throat> towards you as the person rather than towards, I mean, you can't separate the CEO from the person, but I mean, this is more uh, towards... So, Mahindra is always known to sort of, has a tradition of breaking traditions. Uh, when Anand Mahindra took over, you know, he's a liberal arts fan who went to learn to make movies and came back to make uh, tractors and uh, Jeeps and SUVs came much later. You came, come from a background of finance, consulting, and like, I mean, you know, you have a large industrial space plus the construction space plus uh, the tech, esoteric tech space. How do you deal with, how did you deal with the transition? How, how difficult is it for you, was it? So the transition actually has been a very easy one. I think the biggest factor in it was the way it was planned. So Anand and the board planned a very smooth transition over a period of 18 months, where I spent 12 months as a group CFO and then took over this role. Also, I had been in the group for six years prior to that, which made a huge difference in terms of having understood different businesses. And the role that I was in at that point was head of group strategy, which gave me a very close look at all the businesses. And that was huge in making this happen. The second thing that we did was what we call continuity and change. We were very specific about what changed and what did not. And why was it essential to change certain things? We had to ensure that the values, that the foundation we have stayed constant over time. And that communication was very important, especially as a time when the organization is looking at a new leader and saying, are we going to be completely different from what we were? I liked what I had before in Mahindra. Is that going to stay or not? So that continuity and change was extremely important. And the third part is our leadership team. They made a huge difference because it's not one person who can do this. It has to be the team together that does it. So there's one question that got left out in the earlier pitch I just wanted to. So I remember in somewhere around 2005, seven, Mahindra had acquired companies which were dealing with materials, innovation, uh, in bringing down, uh, in changing the energy uh, uh, stuff. I remember uh, something to do with the battery company also. Uh, has that progress? Has, is, I'm asking this in the uh, background of, you know, we talk about Atmanirbhar Bharat, we are talking about supply chain resilience. Uh, so, 
I want you to answer this question in two parts. One part is how is Mahindra doing that story in terms of innovation, getting the technology here? And what do you think, are we headed in the right direction in terms of how the policies are formulated, the PLI schemes and others in terms of the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, idea? So I'll take the second part first. Uh, I think the policy formulation has been very sound. And uh, what we are seeing is a tremendous amount of incentives being given to make in India and be Atmanirbhar. Uh, so from that perspective, it will create a much stronger boost. And we will start seeing the effect of this really over the next five to seven years. On the first part, I would say two things. First is, we actually launched a solar business, which is right around the time frame you're talking about, which would be linked to what, what you recall. Hmm. And that solar business today is one of the largest solar companies in India and is one that we want to take to 10 gigawatts uh, in the next few years. So that's a huge success for us. But I would highlight the second part there, which is when we talk about Atmanirbhar, it's about the ability to, to manufacture world-class products in India. It's not just manufacturing in India. Mm -hmm. And this is where I would talk about the latest car that we have, the XCV 700. Uh, it's not just a world-class car. It will stand head and shoulders above other world-class cars. And the only thing I would tell everyone is, just go and test drive. You will see it for yourself. Right? But that's what makes us proud. It makes us proud that as an Indian company, we've been able to do all of this in-house. And that's what our Mahindra Research Valley has done. That's what our colleagues there have done in being able to manufacture something that is well above what we would call world-class. So you mentioned that you were in a solar uh, uh, power space. You were uh, working in other directions also in terms of climate change. Are the current policies, the PLI schemes, others, do you think they're there enough? There needs to be more to be done. My own take on the solar thing is that we think too much in terms of gigawatts and megawatts, whereas the real story is in converting homes consumption into, uh, so, I mean, making it renewable, you know, there's a kilowatt hour story there. Uh, how do you see the evolution? Do you think that we will, uh, because we, we are fortunate in India, we have 300 days of sunlight, unlike other countries. And even if the lux levels uh, differ, we have uh, a huge coastline, we have uh, wind power, we have tidal power. Are we doing enough to get to that point? So. The cost of solar energy in India is among the lowest in the world. And from that standpoint, for utility-based solar plants, I think we are ahead and well on track. Where we need to do more work is distributed solar. Exactly as you said, having solar panels on roofs of homes and having that generate electricity. Uh, that, in many ways, is implementation now. It's not about needing incentives in that space. Uh, it's about companies going out there and being able to implement it. It does require scale, and that scale will take some time to build. Uh, and then the third aspect there is technology, because we need to be able to get new technology where you can put films on a car and have that charge a car, for example, mm. uh, or to have films on a window of a building, and uh, that creates electricity that can power the building. So these are various innovations that need to come in, uh, and that's something where we will have to partner with others around the world to get them in. Okay, I think now I'll switch back to the personal. So leadership is essentially education, insights, and experience. What I call the experiential. You meet people, you learn something from them, somebody advises. So for the young audience here, what is that one insight or advice that you got, if any? Did you have a moment of epiphany in that sense? What is the one insight or advice that you got, which kind of defines you, your work, and your persona? If I were to put it down to one, I would say an advice I got many years ago was to get control, you have to give up control. And I must confess, I didn't understand this for a long time. Right? Because one always wants to control. 
but as i understood it over the years it was about empowerment for leaders in your team uh, i must say my children contributed a lot to helping me understand this right uh, i have two sons and after many fights with them especially with the older one i understood what it was to give up control uh, and achieve a much better outcome have the trust so trust empowerment all of these things come in with that and that develops a better relationship um, very difficult to do but it's one that i found to be liberating in many ways so you mentioned that it took you some time to sort of get a grasp of uh, this i remember this um, sometime in 1980s my first boss ramnath goenka in pure marwadi financial economic lesson said aadmi 8 ghanto kaam kare byaj 2400 ghanto kaam kare it took me some 5 7 years to understand what exactly he meant so when did you get this advice of it's a very interesting concept to get control you give up control when did you get it was it somebody a professor a father uh, somebody who gave it to you and how long did the transition take so this was one of my bosses about 17 years ago uh, and at that point i had just come in to run a fairly large business and it was part of in a sense training if i were to call it as to how to run large businesses and uh, it did take me i would say a good uh, maybe 7 to 10 years to really understand the full implication of it because the first reaction always was no i must be in control i must understand everything that's happening uh, and it takes time to be able to give that up and once you've done that a few times sometimes very gingerly very gently okay i'm going to sort of give this up i'm going to see closely what happens uh, but after you do that sometimes and then you see okay this actually works it works better uh, then you feel more confident that yes you can do that more so this this sort of goes back to what uh, vinash pandey and we were discussing that you hire good people and let them do their job that is the primary principle i guess give up control to get control is a very good theme to work with and a lot of people who are running businesses or departments in the group should sort of imbibe that uh, before we end i wanted to i asked this question to a lot of people what is that one book that you would recommend management students people who are coming up who are in studying who have just started on their career that they must read this may sound a little corny but i would say the one book that has had a huge influence on me is a book called mission success by og mandino this is a book i read when i was in 11th grade can 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 you re- repeat that let's repeat that book's name for the mission success mission success success okay and i say it's a bit corny because it's in the realm of the power of positive thinking but what that book really unlocked which is similar to what another book did only if you understood the meaning which is jonathan livingston seagull yeah uh, by richard park is essentially to say that the only person to put boundaries on yourself is yourself so you are unlimited in your potential so if you can envision something then you will find a way to get there and that's one book that i give to many friends and colleagues and and juniors even today uh because that's one that has had a dramatic impact uh, for me at least so finally before i get called on time and i know you have a hard stop to get somewhere how does a ceo who's running a large group unwind what's downtime like you for you a uh, downtime for me is time with family and this is one over the years um i would work very hard over the week days i typically come home at 10 11 often later than that uh but weekends were with family even for my boys growing up they had my calendar on saturday and sunday yes sometimes you i needed to work on saturday and sunday but try to avoid that as much as possible but they knew that they could decide what my activities were going to be and for me that's been the best downtime uh over the last year it's been a little tougher to have the weekends i try to get a day to myself if not two days 
Um, but that again is family time because that to me is the best way to recharge. No, my question extends beyond that. So what does Dr. Anish Shah do when he has, say, a couple of hours to spare? Does he click on Netflix, Amazon? Does he watch ABP News? Uh, we are all news junkies. Indians, I think, are the biggest news junkies in the whole world. Uh, you'll never find any Indian anywhere who does not know what's happening in some remote part of the world. So we are all news junkies. So what does Dr. Anish Shah do? Uh, does he take off for a trek? Does he do uh, uh, sort of pick up uh, the remote and switch on the TV, watch it, or go out for a movie? What 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 does Dr. Anisha do? Okay, so you may not like this answer, but as a family, we haven't watched television for the last 15 years, except for watching cricket. <laughs> right. um, news comes from various sources now. But what I love doing is uh, playing cricket with my boys or playing uh, soccer or, or uh, we often play American football as well. Uh, love watching sports, uh, love reading, uh, just sitting and having a conversation with my wife. Uh, traveling, not a two hour activity, but uh, we make it a point at least twice a year to go out and travel as a family and spend some time. Uh, so these are the cassette of activities that I would have. I, you're not that unique in the sense that you don't watch TV. Most of the youngsters in the audience, they all watch on their mobile phones and devices. Uh, I think more news is consumed on devices and on portals than anyone else. My final question, what is the book that, what, what book are you reading just now? Uh, P.G. Woodhouse. Ah. <laughs> right, so not... I often will read P.G. Woodhouse for downtime. I think it's one of the best ways to relax. Uh, business books, I've read many over the years, but I look at that more as sort of work rather than downtime. So I, I would talk about P.G. Woodhouse. Leave it to Smith is, is the one <laughs> at this point. I'm currently reading a book by Sebastian Malaby on power laws. It's the history of venture capitalists. If anybody who's into books, they should read this book. This is a brilliant book on how venture capital actually started in the East Coast about 40 years back. Great book to read. But thank you, Dr. Anisha, for uh, your time and elaboration on what is a very difficult transition and a very difficult uh, subject to uh, sort of elaborate on. Uh, I think he deserves a big round of applause. Uh, Yeah